Okay, I'm joined today by Nero Feliciano, a cognitive psychotherapist and best-selling author of This Book Won't Make You Happy, Eight Keys to Finding True Contentment, and she's also a mother of four. Nero, really appreciate your time today. Oh, I'm happy to talk about this because it's on everyone's minds, and especially, you know, I have four kids, elementary school, one in middle, and two in high school, so we're having different kinds of conversations depending on the age. So I know most adults are really struggling with the state of the world right now, a war in the Middle East that for a lot of us hits really close to home. There are concerns that it's going to spread. And there's also this rising level of hate that we are seeing hundreds of thousands of miles away from the Middle East right here in the United States. So the number one question that we have been getting from parents is at what age is it appropriate to start talking to kids about what's going on. So Jill, if you speak with child psychologists, they say that any age where the child is affected is appropriate. We have to give them some context. Now, what we say to them is going to vary by age. But if a child is affected, meaning they're in a family where there's heightened emotion, they may be going to a place of worship that now has changed. They may have a family member abroad or someone in the military serving. These are kids who are more aware that something's going on and a conversation needs to be had. Generally, if children are not affected, they say around eight or older, if there is talk of war or the situation, you can begin the conversation as young as even four, five, six, depending on the child's maturity level. But like I said, if a child's impacted, any age is okay. It just it's going to vary what you say to them. It has to be age appropriate. So let's start with that age four, five, six. Mm-hmm. What is an appropriate way to talk about this? What are, could you give us kind of like a script? What are some words and ways that would feel not frightening for a kid? Yeah. So, you know, we're, it depends on have they heard already? We want to give them some sort of context for what they're seeing, even in our family. And and what I'll preface this by saying is, like you said, this is a hard situation um, intellectually, emotionally, mentally for adults to get their mind around, let alone kids. We need to make sure that we process our emotions before entering a conversation with the child. That conversation with the child is not a good format for them for us to begin to process our own stuff. We have to be clear on what we're saying going into it. At four years old, what we want to do is have the information be very concrete, but low in detail. You can say things like people across the world are Um, trying to get food and shelter and they're helping each other right now because they are going through challenges. So very low in detail. Um, Always it's good at that age to focus on the helpers, you know, focus on the helpers. Who is helping who? Because kids are always interested and encouraged by that. But with any conversation with a child, especially a child who may be impacted, you want to start with what they know. Is there anything that you've been hearing at school about things going on in the world? If you have, let's talk about it. Let's start with what they know, and then we can begin to figure out where the conversation needs to go from there. It's also really important that whatever they're feeling, we as parents normalize and validate it. So if you have kids who are feeling anxious and fearful, it's important that you say to them, you know, it's normal and it's okay to feel fearful right now, especially when there's uncertainty, we don't know what's going to happen. But even with that feeling, we can still go on with our lives right. and look for ways to be helpful. Right. And and kids love to help. So whether that means um, drawing pictures or writing notes about peace, art can be very therapeutic or collecting money or doing a drive that helps to give them a sense of agency and control in the situation where we actually don't have much control. That's really great advice. So <clears throat> so kind of have a, a starting point for what information they have and then let them maybe ask you questions about it. Yes, that's right. And we want to do a lot of listening. We also don't need to give them information to questions that they're not answering, asking at that age. You know, we, we want to really focus on what their curiosity is or what they're seeing. Maybe they're seeing that people are really emotional at home. 
maybe they're seeing that people are really stressed at home. And that is something we want to address and say, and say, you know, there are people struggling across the world. Notice I said across the world, because we want to also help them to understand that it's, it's, and although you said here too, right? So it, it may be here too. And that's what we're feeling. We're, fe- we're seeing people struggle and it makes us feel sad as well. One of the things that I was reading, I think you actually sent it to me, uh, was about in terms of especially the young kids is you want to make sure that they feel safe. Yes. How can you, what are some ways that you can do that while discussing a topic as heavy as war? No matter what we talk about, whether it's war or school violence or anything disturbing to a child, that should be one of our primary goals in the conversation is to assure them of their safety. And part of assuring them of their safety is also reminding them of our role as parents. We're there to take care of them. We are here to talk to you. We're here to take care of you and you are safe. Um, And even if that means you're safe here in our home, you're safe because you have your teachers at school. Assure them of their safety. Now, there are many parents who struggle with that in different situations, especially for kids going outside of the home. You know, we worry about their safety in different environments. But in that conversation, we want them to walk away knowing that we're there for them and it's our job to keep them safe. Because they're always going to go back to, how does this impact me? It is something going to happen to me or people that I love. Okay, now let's get to some of the older kids, uh, mm. perhaps a little bit older elementary, middle school. What are ways that parents can talk to those kids? So we're having these conversations at home because three or four of my kids are middle school and up. And one thing I think is same thing. It's important to start with what they know. What are you hearing at school? Now, middle school and up know that there's a war going on. What are you hearing about the war? What are your friends saying about it? And also very importantly, what are you seeing on social media? We've had very specific conversations with my kids about limiting social media and also vetting their resources. How do we get reliable information about what we're seeing? Um, Talking to them about biases that we may be seeing coming from different sources. This is a really important time to educate kids who are older on how to get information that's reliable and also to recognize that there's going to be a lot of misinformation, especially as events are unfolding. What do you say if a a teenager comes to you and they have a different opinion about what's going on than you do. Mm -hmm. You want to really listen and give them room to talk about it and explore what makes them feel this way. What makes you think like that? Where have you gotten your information from? And it could be a difference of opinion based on credible things that they've seen and heard. You know, As with an adult, you can agree to disagree. But I think also because we're having these conversations in families, it's important to include in these conversations what your family values. And discuss that and talk about why your family values these things, because then it gives them also a context and a lens through which they can also begin to look at the situation. One of the questions that I got from somebody was asking me about this rise in anti-Semitism that we're Mm. seeing. And she said, at what age do we start explaining uh, the existence of anti-Semitism to our children? She says, I don't want to scare them, but I want them to be informed. And I also want to protect them. So how do you even enter a conversation like that? You know, the way I relate to this conversation, Jill, is being a person of color with a son who is dark skinned. And in general, we know we have to start these conversations early with our boys as they're entering society and growing up. One, to normalize it in some way. And again, if a child is impacted and affected, if they see something changing in their environment, we want to begin to have that conversation. I, I think what experts tend to recommend is around eight years old developmentally could be appropriate for them. But again, no time is too early if a child is impacted. It, it's more about how we talk about it. And we can explain to them that every ethnic and cultural group have, has faced situations where people don't like them where they say mean things and do mean things. And often it's because they don't understand who we are. 
and they may never have gotten to know a person as a friend who comes from the culture that we come from. And it's important for us to put kindness out in the world and also explain to people who we are, be ourselves so they see that. But again, you can explain it in a very general sense. And also, I do think it helps for that child to know they're not alone. There are other people just like them who are experiencing that as well in different parts. And they have families who are there to protect them and and be with them and celebrate their culture. There are other ethnic groups that experience it as well. So they don't feel like this is something that's just something that I'm going to go through by myself. And that would be the same advice. Um, is that the same advice that you would give for maybe a Muslim um, family or a Palestinian who is watching images of, of people who look like them and, and their relatives that are just heartbreaking? Uh, how, how would you approach that type of conversation? The same, the same. And, and I think it comes down to And I can tell you, my mom explained this to me as a 30-year-old when I got married and my in-laws really didn't want much to do with me. And she said, you know what, Nero? They don't know us. They don't know us. And that's why they they believe certain things um, because they don't know us. And and for me at 30, that was helpful, you know, even having studied race and psychology at that point. You know, because that's what it comes down to. So helpful. And I'd be remiss to have you on and not ask you just really quickly for adults right now who are Mm. just really, really struggling just with the emotional toll that this is taking. Mm. Any advice on things that that adults can do to just maybe get their mental health into a little bit of a better place? Yeah. And I I wish you could do this, too. But I know in your field, it's difficult. (laughs) We need to step away from the being inundated with information constantly. And it's really hard to turn it off. And we have to remember that social media is designed to be addictive if that's where you're getting your information. But limit the times where you're taking in that information. And we have to also set times, downtime, times where we're connecting with our families and people who um, we find strength in. This is a time for many people to lean into their faith, whatever their faith is, because we're in situations that oftentimes we feel helpless in. So so this is a time where we actually tend to grow in our faith and develop resilience and spiritual strength. I would also say for kids, we want to make sure the family and the home is a place of connection where they feel safe in their own spaces. And that may mean we have more conversations or we watch movies or we play games or we're we're holding and there's more physical touch in the family, especially with kids. But that can also be very healing for adults in this right. time. For really, really young kids, um, if just say they aren't, you think somehow they aren't being impacted, can you just leave it and, and let them be a little bit sheltered until they get yes. a little bit older? Yes. Yeah. If they're really young and they are not impacted by it, you do not have to bring up that topic unless you feel like it's really important for some reason. And then again, very low detail. Um, and like I said, you can talk about the helpers, you can talk about people who are struggling. And I would say it's important to say that it is across the world when you're talking to kids that young. But if they are you know, blissfully unaware They can stay blissfully unaware for a little longer. They will soon enough find out. (laughs) Childhood goes fast. Right. And then a little bit older, middle school, um, especially high school, even if you think they don't know what's going on, they probably do, right? They do. And they're hearing it from other places. And it's important that we also know what they know and what they're thinking and listen and give them an opportunity to talk about it and then correct misinformation. Got it. Okay. Uh, Neuro Feliciano, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure.